they asked me for a title um, for this talk, and I said, sometimes less is more. You see what I did there? Right? Um, all right, we're going to start with a little story. In the year 1911, two teams were racing to be the first humans to reach the South Pole, which was the last major place on Earth not yet discovered. Royal British Navy Commander Robert Falcon Scott led the first team. Scott was a veteran explorer, having led uh, the first expedition to the Antarctic, and the British public hailed him as a hero. The leader of the second team was a lesser-known Norwegian named Royald Amundsen. Driven to make history, he too set his sights on the South Pole. Scott's team from Great Britain fielded an extremely superior resource bucket, including a grander ship, a larger budget, and a bigger crew. From the start, it was truly an unfair race. Both teams embarked on an 800-mile journey to the Pole. And after an incredibly difficult 54-day journey, one team, shown here, planted their flag at the Pole and began the became the first explorers in history to reach. They planted their flag and then journeyed back to their base. The other team, exhausted, malnourished, limped to the pole 34 days later, only to find the other team's flag whipping in the wind. One leader and his team achieved the extraordinary, while the other team perished in the polar night. The thing is, Amundsen's team is the one pictured here, the team that was outnumbered, outfunded, and by all accounts, outmatched. It wasn't even a fair fight. So why? What made the difference? Over the years, authors have profiled this journey and have offered several possible explanations. Was it better pacing, better self-control, good planning, or just plain luck? However, many accounts neglect one critical part of the dramatic South Pole race, which was first highlighted in a book called Great at Work by Morton T. Hansen. The difference is in the scope of the expeditions. Amundsen's team was the one with the narrow scope. As I've already mentioned, Captain Scott commanded three times the men and twice the budget. Continuing his theory that more is always better than less, Scott used five forms of transportation. Dogs, motor sledges, Siberian ponies, skis, and man hauling. If one failed, he had backups. Amundsen, however, relied on one form of transportation, dogs. Had they failed, his quest would have ended. But the dogs didn't fail. They performed. Why? It wasn't just his choice to use dogs. Scott took dogs also. Amundsen succeeded to a large degree because he concentrated only on dogs and chose to forego any and all backup options. Amundsen absolutely obsessed over obtaining the most superior dog. And then he enlisted expert dog trainers, inspectors, and even apprenticed with Inuit natives to learn everything he possibly could about dogs. Scott, on the other hand, was so busy arranging for five separate transportation modes that he truly couldn't focus on any one of them. For example, rather than venturing to Siberia himself to secure ponies, he sent his aide. However, his aide knew absolutely nothing about ponies. He was a dog expert. So Scott's team ended up with 20 completely ill-suited ponies, which slowed them down in their journey to the pole. Scott got tangled in a very complex operation, a somewhat disorganized fleet, as he later reflected in his diary. Amundsen, meanwhile, had fixated on a single transportation mode and was speeding across the barren landscape, gaining at least four miles on Scott every day on average, and by the time he reached the pole, he was over 300 miles ahead. Amundsen had chosen one method and mastered it. As Hansen notes in his book, Amundsen had done less than obsessed. So, who am I? For those of you that don't already know me, uh, my name is Tara Moore and I'm a wife and mom to two amazing kids. I'm a proud second generation realtor. And I, am, I was honored to join this group in 2015. Um, and I'm extremely honored to stand here before you and share a bit of our story today. Um, so why did I start with this story about the South Pole? Um, with intentionality and extreme focus, my husband, who's also a licensed uh, realtor, 
and I have chosen to keep our brokerage small with just the two of us, um, breaking the mold from what I'm seeing in our industry right now and have been following for years. We have no assistance, no admin help, no coordinators, no transaction help, no agents under us. Yet we have consistently operated a huge business in Central Florida, closing anywhere between 75 to 85 transactions each and every year consistently, um, approximately 25 million in sales every year with just us. All while keeping raving fans um, who regularly post five-star reviews and send multiple referrals and just overall happy, happy people. Just like the, um, the Explorer Amundsen, we have chosen to do less and then obsess. So how do we do it and why have we chosen to operate our business this way? First, let's get a couple disclaimers out of the way. Um, obviously, these are just my opinions. Um, there's no one-size-fits-all model. One of the things I love most about our business, and particularly this group, is that we are all so amazing. We're richly diverse in how we operate our business. And what's right for me may not be right for you, but that doesn't mean that we cannot all be amazingly successful. Um, and I am also not here to hate on growing or growth or bashing teams. That's not what I'm here to do. And some of you are um, chasing big dreams and big goals, and that is totally okay. But for some of you, you are following a roadmap for success that has been ingrained in you without ever questioning it, without ever saying, why am I doing this? And my life changed when I stopped and took a step back and just called BS on all of it, okay? We live in a culture that is just striving for growth each and every day. And you hear, hear these things like, if your business isn't growing, it's dead. You know, higher, higher, higher. Um, and I think this is an admirable mindset, but I think it is a shame to believe that this is the, uh, the only way um, for everyone and the only way to be successful and happy. Or that you can't live a fulfilled life, you know, you're not in this constant, never-ending rat race of striving for more, okay? When will it ever be enough? I'm here to encourage you and perhaps show you a different perspective um, and to tell you that you can be wildly successful and happy without building and building and going and going and going. Okay, so we have to start with the society and the culture that we live in. Um, it's no secret that we live in a, a culture of more. We have an outrageous um, and insatiable desire for bigger, better, faster, stronger. And as a nation, I believe it is almost killing us. We are living in a time and a place when we have the best standard of living in history. We have access to more wealth, more medicine, more self-help, more technology, more information, yet we are constantly craving more. I think as Americans, we become really confused about um, what's going to make us happy. We are literally trying to buy our way to happiness. Things are cheaper and more easily available. Instacart, 24-7 online, get it now. Um, so we've literally, as Americans, gone on a buying spree that's unprecedented in history or anywhere else in the world. Um, I mean, we hear this morning about a journey 160 miles to walk to a school as a seven-year-old, right? So that's perspective. We aren't buying this stuff with our own money. We are, as Americans, buying it on credit, burying ourselves in mountains of consumer debt. Okay, the data is staggering. Here's just some quick statistics. These papers are really. You would think that we had learned from the events of 07 and 08, but as it turns out, Americans have a really hard time learning these lessons. Revolving credit outstanding is currently well above the 2008 levels. We reached that point in mid-2017, which was less than 10 years after the market crash. To top things off, we also have a $38 billion personal storage industry. In America, there are 14,000 McDonald's restaurants, right? There's one on every corner. And over three times as many self-storage facilities holding in excess to 2.3 billion square feet of rentable space, which in theory stores the overflow of the American dream, right? You know the phrase, keeping up with the Joneses. With the evolution of social media, the Joneses aren't just our neighbors anymore. The comparison game is played every day, all day, 24-7, and it is with people that we don't even know. Um, 
The line between what is real and what is fake is exaggerated, photoshopped, and now extremely blurred. There's no denying that the idea of what it is to have made it in our culture has changed dramatically. The bar for our success is constantly raised, which means we are constantly craving more without any limits many times. And it feels for many of us that true contentment can never be reached. There's a fascinating concept in psychology, which is called the hedonic adaptation principle or the hedonic treadmill. What psychologists have found is that we each have an individual happiness set point. And this is from birth, typically. A full 50% of our happiness set point is due to genetics. And another 10% is affected by other circumstances that we simply can't change, who, who we're born to and where. This leaves only 40% of our happiness that is actually subject to our own influence. In layman's terms, if something good happens to you and your lifestyle or your life changes in a positive way, those changes will cause a certain boost in happiness, but it won't stay there forever. Ultimately, you will return to your set level of happiness after a period of time. And the same thing goes when something negative happens. The treadmill itself occurs when we, as consumers, see something that we don't currently have and the seed of want is planted. We find that our thoughts and our focus tend to shift to this thing that is missing or desired in our lives, sometimes in an obsessive, destructive way, until we finally have the opportunity to buy or achieve it. Then we are finally happy. But wait, there's a small problem. After a short while, we as humans adapt, again, to having that new thing or that achievement that was once so great loses its luster. And we begin to s opening our eyes again to see the next thing that we want and desire that's going to, of course, make us happy. And the cycle continues. There's a very real um, comparison here to the high, uh, the addiction to sugar, caffeine, or really anything. We're constantly craving the next level of success that we believe will make us happy and allow us to reach that level of solid content contentment, you know. If I get here, then I'll be happy. If I find this, then I'll be happy. Um, but the reality is similar to sugar or caffeine or anything. It creates an instant jolt and then a crash back down, and then we resume looking for the next thing. So how does this all relate back to real estate? I believe this crazy treadmill is very evident in our business also. I have seen happy, fantastic, very productive realtors gr grow, hire people, add agents, form a team, build a huge brokerage, following the growth path and doing what they thought they should be doing, only to be miserable in over their heads. They tell me in private, I really, really envy you, Tara. Like, I just love to get back to selling and my customers and managing only myself, my family, my transactions, and my people. They followed the perceived roadmap for success in this business without questioning, why am I doing this? Is this what I really want for my life and my business? They were told or made to believe that growth and expansion was the only way. In 2015, my business was growing at such a rapid pace that my husband made the amazing decision to quit his corporate career and join me. After that point, the business continued to grow so much that we came to yet another crossroad. Should we continue to expand? Do I start hiring people? Let me just stop here and say that it is at this point that I feel like most high-producing agents do not even stop to ask this important question. Um, they don't say, should I expand? Would I like to expand? It, it's an immediate, it is now time to expand the business. When I started consulting with other realtors and interest, industry groups that I trust, I received one resounding response. Wait, you're burning out and you have more business, more referrals than you can handle? What are you waiting for? Why didn't you hire two years ago? Hire an assistant, hire three assistants, hire a team of people that could make your life so much easier and so much better. Here's the thing, I couldn't just accept that as the answer and go forth and do that. Um, I had to dig deeper and ask questions like, why am I in this business in the first place? What drives me now? What do I like about the business? How do I define success? How much is enough? How would our lives and our day-to-day -day look different if we were leading a team? What would we gain from forming a team, and what could we stand to lose? Do I have the skills of a salesperson, or do I have the skills and mindset of a manager, leader? 
And would we really enjoy stepping away from selling and moving to managing agents, assistants, team? So as I started to dig into these questions and do a lot of self-reflection, a lot of talking to others, I realized a few really important things about myself. Number one is, I really, really love this. I love real estate. I love the selling aspect. I love the day-to-day, -day, the clients most days, the details of the transaction, even the things that so many people have told me, that is a $15 an hour task. Why are you doing that? I love it all. Generally making a decision to grow a company or build a team is an active decision to step away from these things and move to a management training development side. And I just knew in my soul that I would not be happy. Number two, the skills of a salesperson or many times realtor in the sales role, even a top producing one, are not the same skills that are needed to be a quality leader of a team or a brokerage. In the corporate sales structure, Salespeople, the top salespeople, get promoted to sales manager, right? So it's no surprise that our world of real estate has kind of adopted this mentality also. But just because you have the skills of a great salesperson does not mean that you will automatically be a great leader and a manager of people or that you would even be happy doing it. That's the primary thing. You could be great at it, but are you happy? In fact, there are whole studies that prove this point, that only about one in every six candidates who are a strong fit for a sales role are even a fit at all for a management role. Studies show that at the heart of every great salesperson is a strong achievement motive. That's that gnawing, never satisfied, always hungry, relentless drive for the next thing. Sales is the perfect environment for an achievement motive. There is a different motive at work in great managers. Where salespeople are driven by the need to achieve, great managers are motivated by the need to influence, to have an impact on the world. Importantly, influence for them doesn't always have to be a personal success. It can be driven by the success of the team as a whole. As I was really digging deep and being very honest with myself, I realized that I'm personally driven very highly by achievement. I am a true salesperson at heart. I also knew in that moment that my main motive for hiring was to fulfill some of my own immediate and somewhat selfish needs for relief, not with the desire to build up and train others and influence others. Number three, financially, we really did not need more. In fact, we could do with a whole lot less. I will dive deeper to this in a few minutes, but we have made a very intentional choice to live very well beneath our means. So what was this going to cost us if it wasn't money? For us, the answer was our time with our kids, less time and freedom to travel, and less direct time with buyers and sellers. Oops, I skipped ahead. But um, number four, of all the places I looked for advice on my next step in the business, what I found that not one person told me that it was okay not to expand until I talked to Tony. <laughs> Um, no one told me that hiring might not be the only choice when I was burning out. I didn't even realize that I had another choice. After digging through this time of self-discovery, I started looking at my business in a whole new way. If I am burning out from trying to do too much, instead of hiring so that I can do even more, what if I started to do less? What if I became insanely efficient at the three to four core things that have made me successful and said no to everything else? As I was navigating through this whole journey, I stumbled upon this amazing book um, called Small Giants, Companies That Chose to Be Great Instead of Big by Bo Burlington. This book highlights a variety of companies who had the opportunity to grow and expand, whether financially or geographically, but chose to stay small and pursue other goals and priorities, and by doing so became truly great in other areas such as customer service, creating excellent quality products, and achieving great work-life balance. One of the CEOs in this book highlighted this, I've made much more money by choosing the right things to say no to than by choosing the things to say yes to, which I measure by the money I haven't lost and the quality I have not sacrificed. As we already discussed, there's no denying that there is a certain benchmark for success in our society. It is growth. What are you doing to create more business, more clients, more accolades, more success? Getting to the next level as a business 
means major increases in sales or volume. Certainly no one thinks that getting to the next level means having fewer sales. The phrase next level in itself implies that bigger is better. We decided that if our main goal wasn't expanding, it freed up our focus and our time for other top priorities. We decided what those two top priorities would be, and it's personalized, high-touch service, and consistency. If I wasn't going to grow every year, I wanted to stay at the same level every year. So how do we do it? I've put together a few thoughts for you. Um, the first one is finances. So as I already mentioned, we are up to our eyeballs in debt as Americans. Um, uh, for us personally, in 2012, we were spending every dang dollar that we made and then some. Um, we had maxed out credit cards. We had a large mortgage. Just, you know, we were Americans, basically. Um, we were introduced to Dave Ramsey and Financial Peace University. Um, it absolutely changed our lives. So if you hear nothing else from me today, um, hear this. Please take some time to explore that program and think about working to become debt-free. We committed to this goal of becoming debt-free in 2012 and literally have never looked back. Um, we cut up our credit cards, literally we did it on video, um, paid for everything with cash, decided to try living below our means for a change. Um, and we have been living 100% debt-free, mortgage included, other properties, rental properties, since 2015. And this is the single driving factor that allows me to, me to decide how I want my business and my life to look. And to say no to the society's obsession with more. In the business, we are also debt-free and operate a very conservative budget. I would say that we are a lean, mean, low overhead machine. We ruthlessly scrutinize any and all purchases looking for anything we can do to equal the most bang for our buck small, targeted, relatively inexpensive gestures with the goal of staying immediately connected and also maximizing on my time. One of the most um, cost-effective and extremely impactful things that I've been doing lately is utilizing um, Uber Eats, DoorDash, services like that to send food to a client's home. Um, I'm receiving this stuff quite frequently, right? I'm like, why? I can plug in any address. When I travel, I use it. Um, I had a seller that was a single mom in this crazy market, and um, you know, I was kicking her out of her house for like 30 showings in the first day and a half. Um, so I sent her a quick text at, when she came home at the end of day two, and I said, listen, I appreciate you more than you know. I know this has been hard for you. Um, here's three places. Where would you and the kids like dinner tonight? I'm going to have it sent to your house. It literally cost me less than 50. They chose like Chipotle or something. It was ridiculous. Um, and she still talks about that and, still, and tells people that I did that for them. Number two, um, the number one question I am asked is how do you find the time to do it all without a team and without assistance? Um, and I'm not up here trying to say, whoops, how do I go back? Um, that I'm not ridiculously busy. But just like the explorer Amundsen, I have chosen to not do it all. I do less and then obsess. I'm highly, highly selective with my time, and then I apply intense targeted efforts to those things. At the simplest level, this meant defining my specialty and limiting my area within a designated radius for my home. I refer out any and all commercial in inquiries, investors, anything that doesn't fit you know, my mold of what makes the most sense for me and my time. Avoiding a complexity trap. Um, the pressures of more that we discuss doesn't just apply to sales volume and building a team. We are constantly bombarded with the allure of more technology, more systems, more tracking, more products, more everything, right? Um, when most people think about maximizing efficiency or the phrase work smarter, not harder, I would say that some of these things come to mind. Avoid distractions, prioritize, delegate, enlist more systems, use more technology, but what about just doing less? In many ways, I believe that the same technology that is supposed to give us efficiency and simplicity as a lifeline is making our lives so overcomplicated and robbing us of our time and our energy. It's just common sense that the more items we attend to, the less time and attention that we can give to each thing. For me, I've found that extreme simplicity is key. I focus on one social media account, which is Facebook, because that's where my sphere lives. I request client reviews on one platform, which is Google. I don't have a CRM. I don't have a digital calendar. 
I'm choosing to focus my energy and my time on the face-to-face relationships over tech, and it's just what works for me. If I had to have the choice between creating some kind of crazy drip campaign, which I know some people would say, you can do it in 10 minutes, or scheduling a coffee with somebody in my sphere, I'm choosing the face-to-face coffee every single time. I find that when my mind is not bogged down with complexity, I am free to think about the client and their needs and what special touches I can do that will be impactful through the entire process. And then it just kind of, somebody mentioned I buyers and stuff like that, and I believe that that is how we stay relevant in this world, that we're competing with tech, we're competing with the I buyer, we're competing with, you know, um, those personal touches. I found that the number one biggest misconception about choosing to not expand um, or grow is that I must work 24-7 and never go on vacation. I've met team leaders and brokers who hired people just so they could have more freedom and just so they could go out of town, which is one of the wrong reasons to hire. (laughs) But then they never end up traveling because they're stuck managing their people and the team. I know I have a friend that's a broker back home that has 20 agents, and he reached out to me recently because he knows how much we go away. And he has 20 agent staff, and he said, I haven't been on a real vacation in over four years. I've had more freedom to travel and spend time with my family than ever before. In the past four years, we have spent the majority of our summers away in another state. Um, And then in 2020, during the height of the pandemic, I was away. I lived in another state for seven months while still running, you know, this crazy market that we have been having. Um, Managing only myself and my clients and their time frames is the first step that I've found to be able to get away and travel. If I know I'm going to be traveling a lot or as the summer is approaching, I'm intentionally scaling back and being very mindful and careful of the amount of business I'm taking on at that time. Again, being debt free empowers me and gives me the ability to do that and to say no and knowing how much I need to sell each year in advance. If a showing does pop up while I'm away, I do have have formed relationships with other agents. I help them, they help me, it works. Um, Through the years, time management for me has um, really become mostly about one thing, and that is learning how to say no and saying it often. Um, I'm truly committed to this goal of doing less, so it does require, it has required me to get very, very good through the years of saying no. I say no anytime that I feel like something's not a great fit. Um, I really say no as much as I say yes. Um, I just recently turned down a listing that was $1.6 million uh, because I don't do luxury listings generally, and that's just not my thing. Um, So I know that sounds crazy, but I am truly committed to knowing who I am and staying in my lane. I have to say no to the wrong things so I can say yes to all the right things. Okay, almost done. So I feel like all the time um, growth gets all the glory, right? Um, I want to share with you some of the amazing benefits that we've experienced by staying small in size. Um, Number one is control and independence. We are in complete unilateral control of our choices in the business with no one to answer to really on major decisions but ourselves keeping personalized, high-touch service. Um, Since we don't have a team or assistance, when I meet a buyer or seller and talk to them about the process and the kind of service and excellence and the experience they're going to receive, I am confident in these promises because I know that I am the one responsible for the delivery. This has been a huge part of driving our referral business. I have extremely low overhead and low financial risk. So I have nobody depending on me for office space or tech or the next latest and greatest in leads or materials or systems. So I'm able to keep my financial risk in the business very, very low. Um, I have very low stress and great peace. Um, I can assure you I'm not losing sleep over what any other agents are doing or not doing. Um, Freedom and autonomy. So when you build a team or company, um, you have more people to think about than yourself. Whether you realize it or not, you are creating a bunch of mini shareholders in your business. And for me, I desire the freedom to concentrate on how I can best serve clients. And again, I'm not a manager at heart, so I'd rather do that than serve agents um, on a team. Pride. We have an incredible pride um, for our business because it is ours and we have built it. Resilience from changes in the market. During the ebbs and flows of the market, I don't have to worry about the financial welfare of other people, just myself and my family and my clients, and that gives me a lot of peace. This has been especially during, especially the early rocky waters of the pandemic. 
Okay, we started with a story. I'm going to end with another story. Um, this has been shared many times through the years. I know I've shared it before um, online. Um, it's been re rewritten in many, many books, including the four hour work week. And no matter how many times I hear it, it always makes me stop and reflect on what I want my life to be and refocus and reprioritize. So here it goes. An American businessman was standing at the pier of a small coastal Mexican village when a small boat with just one fisherman docked. Inside the small boat were several large yellowfin tuna. The American complimented the Mexican on the quality of his fish. How long did it take you to catch him? The American asked. Only a little while, the Mexican replied. Well, why don't you stay out longer and catch more fish? The American asked. I have enough to support my family's immediate needs, the Mexican said. But, the American asked, what do you do with the rest of your time? The Mexican fisherman said, I sleep late, I fish a little, I play with my children, I take a siesta with my wife Maria, stroll through the village each evening where I sip wine and play guitar with my amigos. I have a very full and busy life, senor. The American scoffed at him. Well, I am a Harvard MBA and I could totally help you. You should spend more time fishing and with the proceeds you could buy a bigger boat. And with the proceeds from the bigger boat, you could buy several boats. And eventually, you would have a fleet of boats. But what then, senor? Well, let me tell you. Instead of selling your catch to a middleman, you could sell directly to consumers, eventually opening your own factory. You would control the product, the processing, and the distribution. You would need to leave this small coastal fishing village and move to Mexico City, then LA, and then probably New York City, where you will run your expanding enterprise. The Mexican fisherman asked, but senor, how long will all this take? To which the American replied, only about 15 to 20 years. But what then, senor? The American laughed and said, that's the best part. When the time is just right, you would announce an IPO and sell your company stock to the public and become very, very rich. You could make millions. Millions, senor, wow, then what? The American said slowly, then you could retire. Move to a small coastal fishing village where you would sleep late, fish a little, play with your kids, take a siesta with your wife, stroll through the village in the evenings where you could sip wine and play guitar with your amigos. So, are you the businessman or are you the fisherman? Are you living a life of contentment or are you constantly searching for more, which never ends, I promise? You've heard so many speakers through the years, right, promoting growth and expansion and this thing and that thing and five million vendors of products at every trade show we go to. Um, and they're all promising you this. You can do more, sell more, earn more, be more. And I'm not saying that those things are bad. And I admire so, so many of you for all the amazing things you're doing. But what I want to encourage you is this. Ask the hard questions before running blindly into this growth. Is that the only way and is that what's right for me? When asking these questions, determining these goals, priorities, please don't underestimate the happiness factor or the value of your own time. More than anything, I want to preach that this business is the best thing in the world because no one else can define what it will be for you but you. It is okay to break the mold. Thank you. <laughs>